Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Good afternoon, Ms. Grace Fu, Minister for Sustainability and the Environment, Mr. Li Ziyang, Chairman of SUTD, Professor Chong Tao Chang, President of SUTD, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us online, where there are over a thousand viewers and here in person in our beautiful auditorium. A very warm welcome to the second edition of the SUTD Design Innovation Forum. I'm Corina Chung, Senior Director of Marketing and Communications at SUTD. I'm delighted to be your MC today. In the last 12 years, as Singapore's fourth public university, SUTD has achieved top position among the world's emerging engineering schools. This year, we are pleased to welcome the first batch of students to our fifth undergraduate degree program in Design and Artificial Intelligence, DAI, the first of its kind in Singapore. This is on top of our four other degree programs, Architecture and Sustainable Design, Engineering Product Development, engineering systems and design, and computer science and design. At SUTD, we are proud to incorporate the art and science of technology and design into an interdisciplinary curriculum that nurtures technically grounded leaders and design innovators to serve societal needs. SUTD's mission of a better world by design forms the foundation of its sustainability plan to create a more sustainable and happier world by design. SUTD places well-being at the core of its sustainability plan, supporting our community to build sustainable lifestyles that grow individual happiness by leveraging on technology and design thinking. Today, we are pleased to partner with the Straits Times to bring you the SUTD Design Innovation Forum. Our speaker and panelists will explore how you can harness the power of design to drive sustainable innovations and a happier world. First, we are honored to have Ms. Grace Fu, Minister for Sustainability and the Environment, to deliver the opening address. Minister Fu, please. Mr. Li Ziyang, Chairman of SUTD, Professor Chong Tao Chong, President of SUTD, many familiar faces, old friends, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A good afternoon to all of you, and it's really my pleasure to be here with you today. Today's theme, A More Sustainable and Happier World by Design, brings to mind a recent sharing by Mr. Liu Tiger, Singapore's former chief planner, Mr. Liu believed that cities should be sustainable by design to meet the growing needs of future generations. And to design such a city, one would need a humanist's heart, a scientist's head, and an artist's eye. We may not always have articulated it in such elegant terms, but these elements are reflected in Singapore's national development journey. Sustainability has been a part of Singapore's DNA since our early years of independence. We cleaned up our rivers, invested in water resilience many decades ago. We have consistently pursued sustainable development by balancing economic growth with environmental protection and social inclusion. And why is sustainability an important design feature for Singapore.
First, we are a small city-state. Within our small land space, we need to accommodate not just housing, parks and commercial centres, but also air and seaports, reservoirs and industries. We have a small population and our demographics are changing rapidly. Our workforce is becoming older and leaner and we have also been calibrating the inflow of labour from other countries. We also face significant resource constraints. Singapore imports over 90% of our food, half of our water and almost all of our energy. We are vulnerable to supply disruptions caused by climate change, market volatilities, and virus or disease outbreaks. Increasingly, carbon is becoming a constraint. At last year's United Nations Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, or COP26, there was strong international consensus to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial levels. To keep this target within reach, the world needs a rapid and drastic reduction in emissions to attain net zero by 2050. Similarly, at this year's budget, the Singapore government announced that we will raise our ambition to achieve net zero by or around mid-century. As a small country with limited land, manpower resources, our trade-offs are much starker than what most countries face. Reduction in our carbon emissions will require serious work to raise energy efficiency, lower energy needs, and importation of low carbon energy sources. But our own experience with sustainability also gives us the confidence to reimagine a greener future through careful long-term planning and implementation, enabled by innovations in policy and technology, not only can we break out of these constraints, we will thrive in a low-carbon future. How will innovations in policy and technology enable our transition? I would like to offer four design parameters. Product, process, system and society. First, product design. Product design with sustainability in mind reduces waste in production, encourages the right consumer behaviour and enables end-of-life recycling. An example is exhibition panels shown here. As a top global destination for meetings, conventions and exhibitions, there is a high demand for such panels in Singapore. Discarded exhibition panels can generate lots of waste and take up valuable landfill space. Hence, I was delighted to learn that for SUTD's open house, the exhibition panels are made entirely from recyclables and are designed to minimise waste from fabrication. As shown here, they can be seamlessly assembled, stacked and stored without any glue or fastener to be easily recycled at its end of life. Second, redesigning processes for sustainability. Process redesign enables us to optimise resource and carbon footprint and turn our scarcity into competitive advantage. One example is the waste treatment sector. In, in this sector is Tuas Nexus. This is an integrated waste treated facility that encompasses a water reclamation plant, materials sorting and recovery plant, an anaerobic facility for food waste and water sludge. The current conventional process is for PUB to treat its water waste independently. Sorry, let me say that again. The current conventional process is for PUB to treat its wastewater independently, reclaim the water and dispose of its sludge in some Macau landfill. At Tuas Nexus, we will co-mingle and co-digest the, the sludge with food waste to triple the yield of biogas, which in turn will generate energy to power the wastewater facility. This enhances energy and resource recovery and reduces overall carbon emissions. Furthermore, co-locating the facilities will lead to land savings of up to 2.6 hectares about the size of our football fields as compared to building the stand-alone facilities. In the agri-food sector, 
there are many opportunities to design and deploy innovative technologies. AI and the Internet of Things could increase farming and resource efficiency. Netatech, a local smart farming company, harnesses cloud computing and automation to drip irrigate its produce. This lowers costs and manpower while raising crop yields. The EcoArc by the Aquaculture Center of Excellence, a closed containment aquaculture production center, combines water treatment technology and offshore and marine technology to maintain quality of its seawater and thus the resilience of its production process. Third, design, designing for sustainability at the system level. A system approach requires us to look beyond an entity, explore the interdependencies between entities and aim to optimize at the system level. We are putting into practice through our 30 by 30 strategy to raise the capability and capacity of our agri-food industry to produce 30% of our nutritional needs by 2030, with just 1% of our land area. We are starting with the development of the infrastructure, master planning the Ling Chukang region into a high-tech agri-food zone to raise fruit production in a sustainable and resource-efficient manner. Our six-month stakeholder engagement exercise last year yielded many ideas to enhance the farming ecosystem. It has helped to further shape our vision to grow more with less by leveraging technology and achieving economies of scale via shared facilities for waste management, post-harvest and packaging. Next, we will introduce circular economy principles where possible, such that the byproduct of an entity can become an input of another in the ecosystem. For example, soup stock can be made from fish trimmings, while the organic waste of poultry farms can be valorized as fertilizers for the vegetable farms. We will increase the climatic resilience of our food sources by turning to R&D that reduces carbon footprint and climatic impact. Nova food products such as alternative proteins can potentially help to meet global food demand with a smaller resource footprint. Production is climate resilient and productive in terms of land and labour. And this brings me to my final point. A sustainable future requires a whole of nation participation. It will only be realised if we do all the above by re-engineering a whole new way of life. We need to bring the entire society along to discuss the challenges and trade-offs to be made and to make the collective decisions that will make the green transition, transition inclusive. And this is why we've put together the Singapore Green Plan 2030 to chart a common vision for a sustainable future and a roadmap for everyone. Through the Green Plan, Sustainability will shape our economy, our infrastructure, our way of life. The pursuit of sustainability will also create opportunities to reimagine and redesign spaces that enhance both resilience and livability. Bishan Amokyo Park is a demonstration of how we have turned a concrete utilitarian canal into social spaces with a river flanked by greenery while retaining its flood water retention cap capacity. It has created a green and blue lung for the residents in the community while retaining the park's, park's flood control functions. We aim to do likewise in our coastal protection efforts for our nearly 300 kilometres of varied coastlines. We will dovetail engineering solutions with the recreational needs of the community while preserving natural landmarks. This involves working closely with stakeholders to minimise environmental impact and to protect existing ecosystems. More importantly, we hope the Green Plan will spark a national conversation and galvanise action. And to cultivate sustainable living, where sustainability habits become a way of life and the social norm. 
for our individual actions will determine the collective outcome. SUTD has vast potential to steer the course. It remains an ideal place to pursue one's passion in sustainability. The university boasts an extensive track record of putting sustainability into practice and designing for a better future. The SUTD Sustainability Plan and its commitment to devote $10 million to sustainability research over the next three to five years will further empower both faculty and students to pursue R&D and design. It has also been an active contributor to social and urban research. A decade on, the Lee Kuan Yew Centre for Innovative Cities continues to deliver impactful, actionable research findings on urban solutions. And let me conclude. Our sustainability blueprint is a work in progress to be designed, to be innovated. Our sustainability journey over the next few decades presents immense opportunities for aspiring designers, architects, entrepreneurs, engineers, and policymakers among us. We are witnessing a global shift towards alternative sources of energy, circular economy, and a sustainable lifestyle. We need innovation in products, processes, systems, and our society. It is up to the humanists, scientists, and artists within us to make our vision for a better future a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, for an inspiring address for rallying our nation to be more sustainable. With that, I would like to invite our first panelist, Professor Chong Tao Chong, SUTD President, to deliver his keynote, Building a More Sustainable and Happier World by Design. Prof Chong, please. Good afternoon, uh, Minister, Chairman, colleagues, friends, students, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to SUTD, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present at this SUTD Design Innovation Forum. Now, today, I will be sharing with you SUTD's plan for shaping the future of sustainable design. SUTD was established from scratch in 2009 as a research-intensive global university with a bold vision to transform higher education for the 21st century. We break down the traditional academic silos and bring together interdisciplinary learning with a strong focus on creating a better world by design. We have four engineering and science degrees that respond to products, systems and ICT-driven services all have design and sustainability embedded in them. And the other pillars, architecture and sustainable design, which is explicitly dedicated to building a more sustainable world. Now, the end goal is to nurture technically grounded leaders and innovators to improve lives, grow economy, and sustain the world. And not forgetting the design of our campus that you are here today, we prioritize not only operational efficiency, but also communal spaces that are passively resonated. Our campus is rated Green Mark Platinum. Now, we also believe that it is, there's a need to develop a unique pedagogy that is beyond just accumulation of book knowledge. This is essential to develop the capacity to see the big picture and challenge the status quo for change and action. To do so, we emphasize on deepening the industry academic partnerships as well as 
equipping students with life skills. This will bring real-world problems for our students to address, such as the uh, senior year, uh, we call industry-sponsored capstone, shown in this picture here, as well as develop critical thinking skills and global perspective. Our aim is to enable our students to be industry-ready, global-ready, and future-ready. Building off our early successes, we are now embarking on a journey to charge our way forward with a series of new initiatives. There are SUTD strategic plan that aims to create a vibrant innovation ecosystem in Changi through holistic partnership with industries. Creation of a cyber physical campus that connects SUTD to the world. And Design Z, our next generation design center, and SUTD sustainability plan. So today, I will share with you more details on Design Z and the sustainability plan and how they work hand in hand to shape the future of sustainable design. Now, in 2021, SUTD launched its sustainability plan to address the biggest challenge yet faced by this earth, climate change, and sustainability. We are injecting an additional 10 million to uplift design to the next level of circularity, to support research, innovation, services, and education as part of SUTD Design Z's value proposition to sustainable industry and society. Now, in shaping our vision for the future of sustainable design, we have emphasized that sustainability is not sustainable without behavior change. This means that sustainability efforts cannot stop when the cameras are off. We will join we must join together and take personal change to address sustainability. Now, to link sustainable technology to sustainable behaviors, we have been inspired by the Japanese concept of shikake. This means a small trigger that can elicit behavioral change. Building shikake's intelligence on behavior into our design thinking is central to SUTD's aspiration to develop sustainable human-centered technology. Now imagine a set of paving stones in a beautiful, like this Japanese garden. If they are well placed, they will invite us to experience the garden in new and unexpected ways, increasing the happiness of our visit. So we hope our sustainability plan can be like a garden path, providing guidance and support to our community, and also affording us a sense of stewardship for an enjoyment in our environment, so that we not only have a more sustainable world, but also a happier one. The sustainability plan commits to three key internal goals at SUTD. One, seeding sustainable research, innovation, and enterprise. Two, education for sustainable action to nurture the next generation of leaders. And three, transforming our campus into an open arena for sustainability, innovation, and solution, we call OSIS. And these three are strongly linked between each commitment and the goal is a holistic and pervasive commi com commitment to sustainability. Now, by collaborating with like-minded partners outside of SUDD, we are amplifying the impact of our sustainability plan. We are in the process of building a coalition for low-carbon future with ambitious partners partnerships. Two of our earlier partners are Sing Health and Northwest CDC. Now, with Sing Health, we are studying the design of low-carbon campuses at both the Changi 
General Hospital and also the new integrated health campus at Berdonov. This includes supporting a future health living laboratories as well as shared effort for continuous education and training. With Northwest CDC, we are designing a green library allowing residents to develop a community level sharing economy as well as reusable future. Now, providing the university-wide sustainability framework, in fact, is our next generation design center we call Design Z. Now, maybe just one slide to talk about the background of design. In the 1300, design is really for the arts and is for individuals mainly. In the 1800s, we have our first industrial revolution and we have the machine that can help designer to think about uh, making products more affordable to the mass. So we have the technology, uh, design technology. Uh, and now in the 2000s, we are living in the digital era. And you can see the challenges that we face are even more complex, more uncertain, more volatile. And therefore, design has to be more intelligent. That, that is not just using the machine muscle, but also your brain power. In this case, to us, is artificial intelligence to solve all these complex issues. So therefore, there's a reason why SUTD have established our fifth major degree major called design and AI. So when we talk about design, it is important to understand what design means to SUTD. And design means actually different, means different things to different people. So in SUTD, we define design as design when powered by technology is the intentional, informed, intelligent, and imaginative force that will drive innovations to improve lives, grow economy, and sustain the world. And we believe that design is the panacea of problems, and design transforms communities and life, and design powered by technology will create even more impact. And more importantly, design outcome must be measurable and also experienceable by everyone. So that is the impact of design we talk about. So under the Design Z, we have four main themes, namely circularity, connectivity, health and wellness, and zero carbon city. And with the four teams, we will have four key programs we call RISE. We stand for research, innovations, services, and education. So in the next few slides, I will share with you some of the, I would say, exciting work that our faculty and students have been doing. Now, this slide <coughs> is one that done by one of our professors, uh, Lynette Chia. Uh, the work is about sustainable transport. Now, with 2 billion vehicles projected to be on the road by 2050, the project investigates how we can ensure our travel needs are sustainable in the long run. The project has aggregated data on community flows and truck traffic to provide urban material flow analysis in Singapore. Next, this project aims to redesign recycling with our current company. The project has developed a mobile app to aid in recycling without disturbing traditional systems like the one uh, current companies are using. Now, Singapore is surrounded by the sea. This research promises to turn the sea into a mega battery. The project developed a desalination battery whereby the salt water, that means the seawater, functions as an electrode facilitating the flow of sodium and chlorine ions. 
We have another project that developed alternative materials. It's a fungal light adhesive material, which is strong, lightweight, and inexpensive. But unlike plastic, the advantage of being biodegradable. The research team has demonstrated methods of creating the world's tallest 3D printed biomaterials tower. There's this recent project to design a sustainable new children's library at the National Library building. It envisions how design can incorporate social, spatial experiences, interactive robotic elements to realize a green, healthy, and experientially enriching library that invites children into the amazing world of storybooks. Now, while we focus on making sustainable impact for Singapore, our goal at SUTD is to make a better world by design, also globally. So let me share this short video on a community-based sustainability project led by our students in Vietnam. Enjoy the video. Thank you very much for joining us today on reflecting on design innovation and sustainability. And I hope we can engage each other today to join us in the future and shape the future of sustainable design together. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Chong. And I hope that the video has shown you how close-knitted our community is. Um, faculty, students, and administrators like us work very closely together to bring projects to life. And now, joining us from the other part of the world, San Francisco, USA, we have our second panelist, Mr. Topher White, founder and CEO of Rainforest Connection. He is joining us virtually today. And thank you, Mr. White, for joining us late at night from where he is. So we deeply appreciate his commitment. And um, without further ado, Mr. White's keynote will touch on conservation technology, the internet of wild things. Please welcome Mr. Topher White. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me uh, to the whole group. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, I think we're going to sort of get into this by talking about design in kind of the furthest from urban environments, uh, the rainforest, places where people really just aren't designed to be. So the first time I visited the rainforest was actually not too far from Singapore in Sumatra, just a couple hundred uh, kilometers from where uh, you are now. 
And if you can hear right now coming over the, the, the speakers of the sounds, this is the sound of Sumatra. Uh, back in 2012, when I visited for the first time. And there's a, a, cop, a cacophony of noise. There's so much noise all the time, different things. And it's hard to pick out individual things, but sometimes uh, animals will stick out, right? So this here is a hornbill. You all must know it pretty well. Amazing large birds. And these are cicadas, pointing cicada. And these, as you must know well, are gibbons. These amazing apes distinguish each other from a distance. I, I play this for you now because it's just so important to, to understand the context of the forest. Sound is what defines life over there. But of course, there's other sounds in the forest as well, uh, major threats that we can all appreciate. And we all know the threats to the forest are something that we all must take seriously. As a technologist out of San Francisco, especially out of Silicon Valley, you can imagine that uh, I wanted to try and build some tools to do that. There are many tools out there to, uh, to, to get involved with this, of course, satellite, satellite imagery is fantastic. You have camera traps, the ability to catch uh, people on, on, on film sometimes. You have drones, you have community monitoring, you have aerial views, but all of these kind of missed out on, on something uh, that became possible when you start channeling what the forest itself is, is, uh, is designed to, to channel, which is sound. So this is what we designed. The very moment that your chainsaw goes off in the forest, the sound is picked by a device up in the treetops, uh, transmitted over the cell phone network uh, to rangers on the ground who get an alert on their phones and jump on their motorcycles and get out there uh, to stop the loggers on the spot in this perfectly realistic rendition of exactly how it happens uh, at all times in the forest. Um, but of course, this does rely upon a piece of hardware up in the trees. We built something called the Guardian, which actually uses cellular technology, originally old smartphones in boxes with solar panels up in the trees so they can last for a very long time. With a powerful microphone, they can listen to all the sounds of the forest continuously and transmit it up through uh, the cloud. This is the Guardian. Uh, this is a, a more modern one up in a tree uh, that, uh, that you can see us installing. Um, and I just want to sort of take it back to how this works. Of course, we're listening for sounds, sound that travels through the forest pretty well. And this doesn't have to be a person listening for it. AI, of course, can pick it out. This is what a chainsaw sounds like at close distance. And you can see this spectrogram that, uh, that design up at the top. That's how our AI is able to pick it out. And visualization of different things becomes very important along the way. Uh, but let's actually go into a, a project in the field and see how this works. We're gonna go to the other side of the world now to, uh, to the Amazon. Here, when you go to the Amazon, you can see this ocean of deforestation, similar to what you can see sometimes in Southeast Asia. Uh, but you have these islands in pretty intact forest. Uh, these aren't necessarily protected areas. These are indigenous reserves, places where indigenous tribes uh, have the rights to protect. Uh, this is the Tembe tribe. When we met them in 2014, this entire purple area was occupied by illegal loggers and, and, um, and uh, cartels. Just going from one town to the next, they went into fully stocked logging trucks. So clearly it was an existential threat for this tribe to be able to protect their land. Um, and we thought we might be able to help. Uh, fortunately for them, they, uh, they were able to uh, mobilize, train 30 rangers, 30 rangers uh, to, to be able to protect against the hundreds of loggers that are there, uh, an area of 2,500 square kilometers of forest. Uh, and you can imagine 30 rangers spread out, makes that pretty hard. Um, in order to make this possible, we trained the rangers to install those devices that you saw to climb to the tops of trees, which we'll get to a little bit later, and to install these guardians. Uh, this is one of uh, the young rangers installing one. And uh, that's kind of how this must work. How can we build a, you know, technology that can resist out in the middle of nowhere, but uh, can, can of course be possible to install by the people who are there. Um, this is actually how it works. Again, the moment the chainsaw goes off in the forest, sound goes through the network up to, um, up to the cloud to uh, an alert, which in this case won't go to government. It'll actually go to rangers who will then show up and stop it. Here's an example of what that actually looks like when they get an alert. You can hear the chainsaws, as I imagine. AI can pick it up pretty well at uh, the same time. That gets transmitted through an, um, a Ranger app, um, uh, the, the app that they have on their phones, so they can actually get out there, uh, confirm that it's a real sound, because again, AI it doesn't really give them much insight, so we have to be able to confirm it's there. Uh, and then they're able to get out there in this case, uh, wait at the end of the road, um, as it's logging trucks on the way out. At the end of the road were uh, well more than 30 rangers uh, who uh, were able to um, seize, the, seize the equipment, seize the truck. In this case, there is no law enforcement in the area. This was all they could do was to burn the truck and kick the loggers out. Um, and this is sort of how they take, uh, they, take, um, they take environmentalism into their own hands in these areas where there is no law and order. And that just sort of underscores how these guys, these people here, uh, this, this tribe member, whether it be um, 
in Southeast Asia or in Africa or in, um, in South America is so important to fighting climate change. Let's back up for one second and sort of point out the fact that as you all know, deforestation is a critical part of the climate change equation, which was brought up in the last keynote. Up to 17% of all the carbon emissions globally come from deforestation and illegal logging, uh, especially in, in Asia, uh, accounts up to 90% of all the logging taking place. Um, and it's not just uh, that you know, all the logging is about cutting down the trees, but logging is so lucrative, especially the illegal logging uh, that they will um, actually create a road. So once a road is cut through the forest to take out the expensive wood, that road then leads to the wholesale destruction of the forest uh, because the road allows small farms, fires, uh, and, uh, and smaller scale logging. If you can stop the illegal logging, you can stop the roads. If you can stop the roads, you can stop the wholesale destruction of the forest, which might make it the fastest, cheapest way for us all to fight climate change today. But we're not in the forest, which is why it's important to work with people like this, these guys who are not they're not technically savvy necessarily, but we can build tools that they will use and they can do um, more in fighting climate change than any of us um, could uh, in our, on our own, uh, individuals of them. So that's why, of course, we are able to partner with amazing brands, including um, including uh, the you know, SUTD and, uh, and some great other brands out of Singapore uh, to be able to, uh, to, to bring this all over the world because technology can be bridged with people on the ground who can make such an impact. Um, but it's not just about fighting logging, right? There's so, as you heard at the beginning, there's so many great things coming out of this. How can we build designs and interfaces to bring these experiences to people around the world? Um, so again, every single one of these guardians we put up is a live stream of audio from these remote places that people can listen into. We have people around the world listening at all times. And, um, and it's not even just about pleasure as well. In some cases, people are able to, um, well, we, we begin to sort of feel all the ways that we can pull out the insights to the animals that are out there. So this is a spectrogram that you saw earlier. This is again, Sumatra that we're listening to. Um, and again, with AI, we're able to then map insights, pick out species and show what's within all of this cacophony of noise. And how can we do it in a way that's experiential, that makes people feel like they understand what they're seeing and hearing. This is our goal, which we'll get to. Uh, and of course, with technology that's in front of us, there's some really amazing things we can do but not if we just go at it from a, a wonky point of view of, um, of uh, what's there, what are the things that we want to know, how do we build experiences around this? Um, so moving uh, on, like, again, this, this shows us that there's so much happening there. There's this sort of fabric, this, these, these maps of, of species moving around through the forest that's uh, accessible to us through sound alone, sound travels. And so you here you can see just this, this rendering of all these different species that they move through. Um, and, uh, and this is kind of what we want to, to, to create. What is, the, what is the fabric of life and how does sound actually express it? Um, that's sort of allows us to sort of point out, this is almost like a nervous system for the natural world. Um, I love to think of uh, design and how we build things in terms of metaphors and analogs, which we'll get to. Um, I, I really think that this is kind of like a human nervous system, everything from sensation, the senses you feel, to how you perceive it, to understanding what's there, and eventually your ability to respond. Uh, and so, um, the way we sort of think about putting our devices out, 100 devices out into the, into the world, um, is about these sort of remote nodes, almost your fingertips, that, uh, that tell you when there's a threat, and then your brain is able to do something with it. Um, that is, uh, that's why uh, when you look at sort of a map of where we are all over the world, uh, it does almost look like that nervous system. And of course, central command is not just us in the cities, it's sometimes people out there in the field who can choose what to do with it. Um, these are the places that we deployed throughout the world sort of in that mind. And let's take into another example here. Um, again, with this AI, we're able to increasingly tell us which species are out there. So here, if you listen in on the sounds of the forest in Peru, and up in the top right, you see this automated list of species that have been pulled out of 30 seconds in one direction or the next or the, or the rest. Um, when we sort of built this originally, scientists were like, why, why are you looking for colors? Why are you trying to make it interactive? I want to try and, and almost create like a, a Google Earth for time series audio data. Uh, the ability for people to not just go to answer the question that they had, but to see more questions, explore and look around for what they, they want to see over time. Which we'll get to later. But, uh, but you know, it's these interfaces, the ability for people not to spend their time sorting through data uh, that we're able to, you know, and already detect several hundred species. Um, and the way we do that, of course, is again through building interfaces. What are ways by which scientists or any of us can hear a sound like you did decide, oh, that is this particular uh, given call? They can just go see the spectrogram, give it a little circle. That becomes uh, sort of almost a seed label in the system that can then uh, be used uh, to search through our databases of hundreds and hundreds of years of audio uh, and pull out um, 
and pull out the sounds they're looking for. Now, this may not seem like a particularly important tool, but it used to take weeks or months to add a single species to the system. This allows us to add multiple new species um, to our AI uh, per day with the science team. Um, you know, this can this can also you know come in handy when you're looking for things that are very rare. Uh, we actually wanted to be able to, to catch elephants when they use elephant infrasound. Um, and so there was the, this great example of hundreds of years of audio out of Africa. Um, and we were able to use the system that you just saw. Uh, these forest elephants are very rare. Uh, they probably only came in, they passed these microphones that, again, hundreds of years of audio, like 120 years of audio. They only came by for several minutes at a time. Uh, and we were uh, able to uh, pick out examples of that the system you just saw. So here's an, uh, here's an elephant kind of wandering through the forest, grumbling to itself, using infrasound to talk to an elephant on the other side of the forest. It would have been physically impossible for somebody to find this um, on their own, again, unless they had months or years, which is why they opened up the data set. And over the course of just a week or two, our interns were able to find it using the system we just saw. And this is what I love. I love the fact that you're there. You can't, you can't see the elephant, but you can imagine what it's doing. Um, this is really the exciting the exciting stuff in front of us when you can offer data in multiple ways to people. Uh, and again, not just about what's happening on land. Uh, I do think it's important for us to understand that sound, bioacoustic, the study of nature with sound began in the water. Uh, and if you go to Vancouver Bay, uh, we have hydrophones that are listening, you know, in these shipping lanes for killer whales, an endangered uh, killer whale. There's just an amazing story of, uh, this is a subspecies, about 70, um, 70 individuals left in the subspecies. So they're very, very um, endangered. But the moment that we're able to detect the whales, they can, uh, in the shipping lanes, the, the locals, they're able to go out and clear the shipping lanes so there's no collisions or threats to the, to the, to the whales themselves. Um, this is actually an amazing example that was caught through, uh, through our system when a new baby was born uh, to this subspecies, which is only 70 individuals. And almost all of them, with a few, you know, more than, more than 60 of the entire subspecies showed up to welcome the baby have a party. These are the amazing sort of moments in nature that are happening. These are really complex conversations, not just amongst whales, but amongst species that we can capture when we listen and AI can help us pick it out. Because if you think about it, the human you know, design is, we're not, we're not designed for, for this type of stuff. We, we can't hear, uh, we can't hear what it, what the animals themselves are saying to each other, not just because our ears can't pick it up, but because our brains are not designed to, to, to sort of sort it out. So what are all the ways that we can change change our, uh, our association with sound to not just be about what we hear, but also how we see and explore it and see the associations there. Um, and through these tools that you're looking at here, again, we're mostly focused on the software. It's almost like you mentioned of a microscope. Um, you mentioned the microscope showed us there was this invisible world that we couldn't see with our eyes. Uh, that was there, that was as much teeming with life as, as the macro scale. Um, it opened up a whole new world of biology, a whole new world of our understanding of our place within the planet. That should happen with these same technologies you're seeing here. Um, animals express themselves and show their association with each other through sound, but human senses can't pick it up. So the combination of these long form audio, um, audio feeds and recordings uh, and AI means that we can almost hear things that humans were never set up to do. Um, it's almost like, um, uh, it's gonna lead, I hope, to, a, to a, an era of discovery as important as you mentioned in the microscope. And that's really what's right in front of us. But the urgency is really there because because biology um, is, is declining, biodiversity is declining by the day. At no point for the rest of human existence where there'll be, will there be as much biodiversity as there is today, it's incumbent upon us to make sure we capture it. But I do wanna talk about uh, the design uh, of, of the devices itself. Um, I've always sort of had a qualm. If you go back in the day, uh, about nine years ago when we started this organization, uh, I always felt like conservation was just a plastic box on a tree. People think that that's sort of the, the way in which uh, technology should assert itself in the forest. But why not take design priorities that say, adapt the design um, of, of what you're building to the priorities of the environment you're putting it in. Um, so in this case, worked almost with a, um, with, a, with a cartoonist, a friend of mine cartoonist who said, you know, you should be, you should be building these, these panels as leaves, uh, it should blend in. And it turns out that that was not just uh, an aesthetically pleasing way to do it. It was also actually beneficial for, um, for gathering light. Because it turns out that you know trees have evolved over millions of years to be able to pick out light that doesn't make it through the canopy um, uh, very well, and uh, adapting that design almost in a biomimicry uh, way can can actually lead to some pretty uh, great outcomes. Uh, this is me putting the first one together in my parents' garage, which is an obligatory step for any Silicon Valley startup. Um, and uh, and as you sort of look forward, the design of these things have changed over the years. 
originally we had taken a smartphone and put it into a box um, because smartphones were pretty great little computers. Um, although pretty quickly we moved beyond using smartphones, it was in 2020 that we fully switched away from it. Um, the other idea about design is that it's ultimately communication. How are you communicating with the people uh, so they know what you do without having to study it? Um, understanding that you put a smartphone in a tree, it listens and transmits over the network. That almost shortcuts you to that final understanding of how the technology works, even if there's much more involved. So communicating through metaphors, then even communicating what you build as a metaphor, in this case, smartphones and trees, has really helped us um, over the years. Um, this, of course, has changed over, over, over a while. Uh, that was the original design. This is the Guardian as you see it today. And I will focus uh, briefly uh, on this. The issue with this is how complex it is. Uh, and again, you're putting these things up to last for years. So it's, it's important that uh, once you put it up in a tree, you don't have to go back. Uh, but also putting things up in trees are, is pretty hard. So this is the box that you see in here, that plastic box is, uh, as I was lamenting earlier on, uh, conservation is plastic boxes on trees. Um, but there's a frame that has some, some elements that goes inside it and, uh, and solar panels that can, uh, that can you know, keep, keep the thing dry as well as pick up as much light as possible. But being able to put the whole thing uh, into say a backpack to carry with you while you hike and hike for miles, um, it may not be something you're selling on a shelf as a consumer product, but uh, how do you actually design it for the use case that is most important? Aesthetics in this case matter less than uh, how easy is it to install? And this is what it looks like when you install it. Uh, again, you have to take that backpack as you climb 50 to 60 meters up to the top of a tree after hiking for, um, for several, several hours. Uh, and then when you're up in the tree, you can't drop anything, pull these elements out of the bag and install them right there on the spot. Um, and then once that's done, once that's in place, the interaction with the hardware kind of ceases. At that point, it's all software, which brings me back to uh, this diagram you see here. Most of what you do in Force Connection is about software, and that's where the magic really, really, really happens, because software is where you can experiment with exciting new designs. That feed we heard at the beginning was from West Sumatra, just a couple hundred kilometers from where you are right now. And you can listen in, you can hear birds, you can hear gibbons, you can hear so much more. And you can see it here on the spectrogram. But as we listen over time, in this bottom right, you're gonna see this, this, this sort of, this white wave coming up. And that's the chainsaw. Maybe you can hear that too. So just a few hundred kilometers from where you are, this is happening every single day with local people who are trying to stop it. But nature itself is persisting and it is continuing. Um, these are stories that we can pull out of everything around us and expose them to users and make them understand that, uh, that this is the earth as it is today. And I'm excited for what's there. Um, and even more than that, we have to understand that, like I mentioned earlier, this is the most biodiverse our planet will ever be between now and the future. So beginning now, as mentioned earlier with Straits Times, uh, we're going to embark on a mission to, to capture eight and a half billion hours of audio over the next 10 years, almost like a, a time capsule of what it sounds like on Earth today, um, to a standard that scientists in the future should be able to use to understand this most interesting, if not terrifying, moment in Earth's history. Um, we owe it to the future of humanity to capture this so they can understand it and appreciate it as much as we can. And, um, and that's what you see here is how do you visualize an entire year of life? This is sound visualized over the course of a year, long duration. We have to come up with creative ways to show people what life looks like and sounds like on Earth. Um, and that's where uh, I'm really excited about where this will go. So looking forward to the panel coming up. Thanks so much for your time. And uh, design is, <laughs> is what makes everything, everything worthwhile. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. White. We are blown away by that presentation. So our third and final panelist is Mr. Patrick Schumacher. He is the principal of Zaha Hadid Architects, one of the world's most forward-thinking architectural firms today. Mr. Schumacher's keynote today is entitled The Metaverse as Opportunity for Architects. Please welcome Mr. Patrick Schumacher calling in from London. Good morning, Mr. Patrick Schumacher. Over to you. Good morning, everybody. I'm very proud to be here. It's wonderful. And uh, by the way, congratulations to TOF, a fantastically stimulating project. 
Yeah, so the metaverse is my recent passion. It's a ma massive opportunity for architects, and I was actually quite happy to see that uh, <clears throat> SUTD is planning a cyber physical campus. So we should talk about that. Um, <clears throat> so this is the recent, a recent passion, but it's also something much longer term for me. Uh, and for, you know, there's been decades of speculation about cyberspace, the metaverse, through science fiction novels, through early architectural theory, at the very beginning of the internet, there was this dream of that becoming an immersive 3D environment. And we actually at the time in, uh, was teaching a studio at the Technical University of Berlin in 95 uh, called the Virtual College. So I'm onto this for quite a while. <clears throat> then we lost kind of track of this, the internet took another turn, it became uh, the domain of graphic designers and based on the metaphor and analogy of a magazine rather than uh, based on the analogy of a city. <clears throat> so I want to talk about this um, positing two premises for metaphors design coming out of architectural theory. So first a general premise concerning the societal responsibility of design in general, and then a premise concerning the specific task posed by the current societal condition, both for architecture and the metaverse design. <clears throat> so the first premise is societal responsibility of design. Architecture and the design disciplines together bear universal and exclusive responsibility with respect to the phenomenal appearance of the totality of the built environment and the world of artifacts. That is with respect to the totality of our phenomenal world. <clears throat> the social function of all design, physical or virtual, is the spatial visual framing of communicative interaction. This framing is a crucial aspect in ordering society by differentiating, defining, and structuring specific social institutions with specific purposes and conditions of success. And I want to add, <clears throat> being stimulated by Tofa, that the spatial visual framing could also be an auditory and acoustic framing. And by the way, these frames are themselves communications. They frame communicative actions, but they are themselves communications premising and framing communications. And that's why appearances matter in as communications, <clears throat> framing communications, which set up the possibility of all interactions. All our interactions are in fact framed by a designer's uh, work. And that includes, of course, events like this, where you where you're gathered in a auditorium and we are structured by graphic designers <clears throat> uh, uh, working out, for instance, how Zoom as an interface operates. The premise two is the task posed by the contemporary condition in particular. With respect to a complex and dynamic post photos network society, the design task of framing implies complex, dynamic, dense, and diverse, but legible, information-rich environments that are to facilitate orientation, navigation, and recognition. Recognition is the identification of specific social situations on interaction rich, productive, communicative, collaborative, social life process, which is also a productive process and a, an economic process. So in this uh, condensed understanding, this applies both to physical and virtual environments and frames. So for, for both, I see this dynamism, this complexity, that density, that diversity. And that's a challenge for designers to cope with that, to articulate that. So, and again, some of you who have seen me talk before, you always have a slide like this. What's the contemporary condition? What's so different from, uh, let's say, the 20th century? The post photos network society, it's a global knowledge economy, and there's this dramatic increase in the dynamism and complexity of cooperation, requiring a new level of communicative intensity, and that means a new level and challenge to designing those frames through which all communication takes place. <clears throat> and what has happened is from photos to post photos, we kind of be set free from the chores of being locked into assembly lines. And we are actually free to do R&D. And everybody can come creative because the technological systems which, in which we're working are, have nearly an infinite capacity to absorb innovation because we can continuously reprogram the robotic fabrication and 3D printing, manufacturing with new ideas, with new designs, and we can continuously upload new versions of apps and software services, a totally different condition. And it develops the social organization behind that, moves from that um, 
static hierarchy you see here on the left to this dynamic ecosystem, which has requires a new city, requires a new metaverse, which is very different from um, you know, a, a, a hierarchically ordered set of uh, magazine pages. So the internet is, of course, incredibly important and a part of that transformation. The internet empowers and expands the division of labor and integration of labor, of course, and, and work and, and knowledge in the global knowledge economy. And that expansion, that globalization is a massive boost to overall productivity, the, you know, because the expanse, the extent of the market allows the intricacy of the division of labor and the integration of, of, of projects across the world. So that's very important. But that internet now gets that boost becoming the <clears throat> immersive internet. And there's a shift um, there will be a focus on real-time communicative interaction. There is a massive shift and change in the interface, which is not just pages and scroll down menus, but a 360 degree layered and dynamic interface. Browsing is very dif different. It's actually an intuitive exploration via the city and architecture analogy. And the interaction richness increases. The density of simultaneous interaction and offering offerings and choices, uh, that all will come together as an empowerment, which boosts productivity, boosts prosperity potentials. I'm quite happy that economic growth was mentioned um, as one of the key drivers for, for a better life, and I agree with that. So I just wanted to show you a few images. The immersive internet is also the immersive city. Uh, the density of inter-awareness, inter-visibility, and I'll just give you a glimpse of one of our architectures which, which gathers hundreds of startup companies, co-working areas, socializing spaces in, in that piece of architecture in the, in the center of Beijing as an, as an example of how maybe the metaverse could start to look like. And a few of our other recent projects emphasize the inter-visibility, inter-awareness, the communication of everything with everything else within a building, but then, of course, also across buildings. So I have prepared nine theses on the event, advent of the metaverse. <laughs> I want to go through that. First thesis is it's a total transformation. The metaverse will deliver vivid telepresence, co-location synergies, explorative browsing, immersiveness, collective experiences. The uptake of this opportunity will be universal. I predict all websites will spatialize, all organizations will move into the metaverse, all physical venues will be augmented or substituted by functionally equivalent virtual venues. Thesis two, a single reality. The metaverse is neither a game nor fiction. Virtual reality in the metaverse will be no less real than the physical reality of our cities. Physically and virtually mediated social communicative inten intentions, uh, sorry, interactions are equally significant and together form an undivided continuous social reality. There will be both competition and cooperation within and across these realms. Thesis three, global meta metropolis. There will be many metaverses, but the factors that promote big world cities, agglomeration economies, co-location synergies in terms of collaborative networks will also drive concentration in large metaverse platforms, I predict. Thesis four, distributed ownership. That follows from the previous thesis. Like a city, a metaverse is a shared platform. It will flourish when it is globally accessible, open source, permissionless. This implies a continuously evolving, diverse, self-organizing community of interest, a community of the invested. This is more compatible with the decentralized forms of governance explored within the crypto ecosystem than with corporate proprietorship, I believe. Thesis five, cyber-urban fusion. Cyberspace will fuse with urban space, implying a radical transformation of built architecture and urban life. Urban and architectural spaces become interfaces and windows into the virtual world. Mixed reality, mixing physical and virtual co-presence will be pervasive. So it's not gonna be all consumed from um, isolated homes. Thesis six, realism. The metaverse exploits the analogy of the city, utilizing our ability of navigating urban and architectural spaces, as well as our ability to recognize places and social situations. 
This requires a high degree of realism in terms of plausible design and photorealistic rendering, at least in the initial phases of the metaverse development, a, a, a close connection to the city analogy and architecture as we've learned to understand it is important. And also, if you think back about the cyber urban fusion, these continuities will remain important, although there will also be, of course, differences. Caesar the seven, some of the architects might like that. Archi the architects take over in the coming age of VR empowerment, empowered cyberspace. It will be the architects, no longer the graphic designers, who will design the coming 3D immersive internet, that is the metaverse. Thesis eight, architecture's essence. This expansion of architecture's remit will further distill the discipline's essence and core competency, namely the spatial visual and perhaps auditory, I would say now, ordering of communicative interaction, upgraded via investment into the subdisciplines of spatiology, feminology, semiology, and dramaturgy. And I won't go into detail on these. It wasn't an extended version of that talk. Thesis nine, congenial parametricism. As native digital style, parametricism is congenial with the ambitions of the metaverse and will become the preferred style here. This is already happening. I see a lot of that coming through. This will feed back into architecture at large and accelerate the dissemination of parametricism. And that is important because the discipline at the moment is fragmented by very, very diverging uh, paradigms. And we need to come together as a civilization with a unified paradigm in, with respect to agendas, values, and updated methodologies incorporating computational empowerment. So that is at the moment, uh, I think there will be a boost for this that finally brings parametricism as the contemporary um, design style and paradigm into more universal uh, empowerment. Okay, I just want to give some illustration, for instance, of thesis five, cyber urban fusion. That is something which I developed with my student at the AADRL in London. So here we have a, an urban quarter uh, in Queens, New York City, a new knowledge economy cluster, where the various buildings, and we've designed four years together, form uh, are these windows into virtual worlds, both in the urban space and the interiors. There are these kind of mixed reality uh, projects. <clears throat> so there will be, all these spaces are highly, at the same time, interfaces of structuring physical co-presence and then inviting in tailor presences <laughs> from across the world. And that was both happening in, in the facade, in interior surfaces, in volume interfaces, which are embedded in the, in the structure. So here we have examples. So we're not going to consume the metaverse necessarily with, with goggles or with, uh, with uh, on our laptop screens or iPhones, but we will be immersively embedded. Um, where we have tromper like continuities of physical and virtual spaces specific to the institutions and um, spatialized interfaces. So we have these mixed reality communications where we have those who are co, co located physically have, feel a kind of real equal pre sense of presence and continuity with respect to their communication interaction. And there's also the, the ability to have adaptive transformability, a kinetic transformation in, in, in the metaverse elements, it's easier and that will also then later on inflect into physical versions of that. I think there is a, a lot of design advances will be made which will feed back into physical opportunities. So um, here we have some of those social situations which are the new equivalent of a shared um, which substitute the isolation on desks with screens and to have shared interface situations with uh, in, in a continuous space where most of these surfaces become temporarily or continuously windows into spatial expansions, virtual versions, uh, mirroring digital twins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that the, and there's degrees of that. There will be we have a whole gradient of conditions which are more focused on 
physical presence or where you're more transported into a virtual world and anything in between. And we're thinking about this, for instance, in this building, uh, we have these floors and then these IMAX like bubbles scooped out. That's where the virtual world becomes more intensive and more, more, more prominent. And where we can start to design more freely. So there's formal and spatial continuities, but they're also now a new sense of freedom and um, anti gravity conditions. But there will, and, and degrees of abstraction, degrees of information overlay and augmentation. And this also feeds back into the physical space, of course. But here we, we, we need to have both continuity and we also have new degrees of freedom, which we can exploit for. Um, communicative also um, making more conspicuous um, making it making it more more legible in fact through through the means of additional um, um, stylizing etc so because we will lose some of the immediacy of sensory participation and we we, we augment it with with additional uh, information streams so all design is ui and ux uh, design. All design is communication. Communication framing further communication. And architecture is there for the UX, UI design for 3D environments, both real and virtual. And I've always been thinking about this in terms of physical design. And now this comes to the fore and it becomes clear that communication is uh, the ultimate design agenda. So, congenial parametricism, again, uh, I have to rely on some degree of familiarity, but I'll show a few images about parameters, in particular uh, parametric urbanism. It's about um, complexity, differentiation, diversity, but made coherent, made rule based, made legible. <clears throat> and I couldn't resist to throw in an, the more, nearly our earliest version of that uh, the Singapore. One North Master Plan, which we won, uh, I think, about 20 years ago, and which has been built out ever since. You can see here uh, the how we establish unity across diversity and allow also, which is very important, individual architects, individual entrepreneurs coming into the process and expressing their individuality, but fitting into a collective uh, district identity and sub identity. You see some of those examples. Uh, which we which have been built, and there's a, a lot of atria and bridges and communication across buildings, and and it's a communicative tissue, but quite dense, and 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 and, and, and quite expressive in individual artifacts. So I just couldn't resist showing this. So I want to uh, move on and sh nearly come to the final part of my presentation when I talk about one of the metaverses we have started to sketch out, and is also a startup company we are participating with. Liberland, Liberland Metaverse. So what is Liberland? Liberland is actually a, a place between Serbia and Croatia. It's a new micro nation which is trying to establish itself in that no man's land because there's been some border dispute and border realignment that throws up this land which nobody wants. And so somebody came along, my friend Jelicka, and declared uh, the micro nation and the sovereign micro nation of Liberland seven years ago. And so we're now going virtual with that. There will be a metaverse, but it will be mirrored with the real territory. And I think that gives a, it's a great story. So here we, we, we have an initial urban cluster. It will be expanded later on. And the case study which inspired us was Decentraland. That's the crypto and um, metaverse which gained some, some traction. But there, also, there was also implied criticism. What we're doing beyond it is that grid. Of, of a relentless grid of parcels. There's a few plazas. There's a number of districts. There's a, there's a gambling district, uh, you know, retail district, Dragon City, et cetera. Uh, but there's also Crypto Valley, and that's what we found fascinating. Uh, it's, it's relatively small, but it is exciting. They have crypto conferencing, there's crypto uh, projects uh, like Polygon have their headquarters there, or you have an open sea. NFT museum, and you have various events happening there. So that's the inspiration to, to look at. There's issues with the entry point and central plaza, which is just a teleporting 
uh, a plaza where you have, we, we actually don't really use a city for navigation and overview. Uh, and that was one of the points of criticism. So this is what we want to do. We don't want to have that list of events and places and teleporting to various things, but we want to overfly a city. We also have a much more high fidelity rendering, the realism element, and we have a much more cohesive and coherent co-location synergy cluster, this industry cluster for the crypto uni universe. So you have here, you see NFT Plaza, DeFi Plaza, City Plaza, there's the city hall, so we're also thinking about you know a lot of think tanks and political uh, thinkers because the crypto universe is also connected with the libertarian universe. So again, the differentiation, the differentiator that makes the Liberland metaverse special, the investment in Liberland metaverse is also gaining a stake in Liberland itself. So it becomes an incubator for a community building, which might actually find a physical registration. The focus on the creek crypto ecosystem, <clears throat> so it's about networking and not entertainment, it's really about productive communication, the collaborative network. And third, uh, thirdly, urban architectural design, it's not all user-generated content. We're starting with the curated urban core with the, where we invite a lot of designing ourselves and curating and inviting congenial designers and then to the outer, and then come to the, the end, the later stages will also involve, of course, a much more diverse set of designers and clients that come in and it becomes more diverse. But it will be guided and led, and the tone will be set by us rather than having just a blank grid. So why blockchain? The key point here is that we believe that these large platforms need the open, that's a question of legitimacy, open source, open platforms, the contributors own and govern that platform via DAO. I think a I believe in that. It's also for us as a startup company, a funding, a low barrier funding route through ICOs and tokenomics. <clears throat> so it just runs through a number of images on this. You can see it's embedded in that island. We're starting at the core, the core at the edge, and then we kind of radiate into the into the into the hinterland. And we've designed a whole series of spaces like the DeFi Plaza, like the, the town hall where there's governance processes. Uh, um, uh, conceived and you can see there's a lot of detail for interaction situations between you know seminars lectures conferences various types of meeting spaces um, that's what we're focusing on um, the way we lay out the, the central districts and we've designed a series of key buildings and we actually have a a the we have a we have a multi project multi uh, firm incubator building and that's where we actually have already started to put in a a proof of concept that's the city hall again it's very important that we have uh, the governance processes also able to use the metaverse use the spaces for 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 assemblies for meetings for think think tanks uh, and 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 committees etc this is the DeFi Plaza. So we can do a lot of great outdoor places. So the difference between interior and exterior in a metaverse is not even environmental. It's not sealing off and climate and rain, but it is about degrees of intimacy. So a lot of outdoor public places will be where you have a high degree of intervisibility uh, will be also used for a lot for social interaction, but then you can just draw into various more um, separate and, and exclusive zones. That's the main purpose of architectural <coughs> enveloping and screening and, and separation. DeFi Plaza, a few more images here. <coughs> An NFT Plaza where you can screen um, NFTs, roam around, and then there's, an, there's a museum with more intimate and closed spaces behind and different versions of that. So it's a lot of the outdoor urban space and the, the, the interaction ground floors, you can flow into buildings much, much easier. There's this kind of uh, lack of closed thresholds. So we have more degrees of freedom here than in the real world. Of course, in the real world, we often try that as well. We try to be super open. Uh, the dream of modernism to have a continue to be an indoor and outdoor. We can really easily make it happen here. So that is, that is City Hall. 
some of the, the urban spaces in between, and that's the incubator building, for instance. So we, it's like, like a co-working, co-locating, very smaller projects, startup companies come together, sharing facilities and open, open ground. And here we have actually developed some of these spaces are now 24-7 live uh, multi-user interaction spaces with, with beautiful acoustics, the ability to share screens. And we can really work, have working, meet and working sessions, presentations in these spaces. So this was the, is the incubator sketch design, some of the situations we're imagining. Um, and there's a diversity of those and the, trans the building can also transform to accommodate these uh, ideas we had in the physical world become much more easy and effective in, the, in, in these virtual worlds. So we conceived the whole building for, for instance, Ethereum Foundation and Ethereum DAO. And uh, Metaverse, we're working with a, a big NFT provider, a whole, a whole building for those and they will be sharing and clustering around a conference center which they can share and use etc cetera, etc cetera. so these are some glimpses some screenshots actually for the for the the part which is already active <clears throat> and you you can go in and and explore and meet meet friends meet people and we're going to celebrate uh, the seventh anniversary of Liberland in an enhanced version of that where we're going to have eight different venues with different acoustic uh, uh, bubbles and large screenings. Um, anyway, we invite you for that. It's on the, on the 13th of, of April, where the proof of concept will be publicly visible. At the moment, it's invited guests, etc. So the NFT uh, or the art gallery. So we're having fun uh, uh, playing with and working with this, and we've worked also with uh, with various artists and art curators, and generated a an NFTism gallery for for Art Basel. So we're out uh, in in the world with first experiments like this. And I finally want to say a few words about the urban planning approaches and policies, because what I really we are asked ourselves the question: How much planning and what kind or what kind, if any, would be optimally prosperity enhancing for uh, such a place. And it's going to be some kind of structuration. We thought we move from the, from the center, from the inside out. We will have, um, obviously, the policy regimes are about enhancing co-location patterns, maximizing positive externalities, that means synergies and spillovers, minimizing negative externalities, um, <clears throat> but also remaining flexible, nimble, and open to new opportunities and changes. So the meta policy here is that we're starting with a simultaneous plurality of regimes and approaches. <clears throat> so we, we have different districts with different policy regimes and we can then try out, we give choice and we can try out which flies and which would, would, would be expanded across the whole um, metaverse or which, have, which, will, which, will, which will grip more uh, realm and which will be less successful. So we have the distinction of the sponsored order the three subsidiary uh, ideas of anticipated curate or rule-based orders. This is where the, the DAO, or we as entrepreneurs, set the tone. Then we have a series of districts surrounding that, which is self-governed, where we're saying those who buy and invest there uh, will, can ha will be, fa be facilitated their collective action processes. And then we have a third realm of a fully spontaneous order where there be no rules or as little rules at all to really allow that discovery process to flourish <clears throat> and have these co-location synergies and experiments very kind of unrestricted. So we have the top down, the meso level and the bottom up, simultaneously operating central planning, private planning and no planning. <clears throat> and this is the image where we're starting with the curated urban core, the self-governing districts, and then the free for all, nearly freewheeling exploration at the at the outer edges <clears throat> not much damage can come from that so let's risk more degrees of freedom let's not that's the the message here <clears throat> so we, we that's where we start off with and i believe the hope here is that that we generate a kind of multi-species ecology where we don't need a central plan nature doesn't have a, a central plan <laughs> there is no god but it's it's a bottom up <clears throat> co-location synergy symbiotic there is an arms race of competition as well but the, the outcome is actually very legible very intricate base 
very um, uh, beautiful. So that was a hope is for, for, for something like the Liberland Metaverse. And I hope it sets a tone for many other Metaverse projects. And this will actually embed it into, in a larger ecosystem, which you're working at the same time as well. So with that, I want to hand back and I'm curious about our, our discussion. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Mr. Schumacher, for bringing us to the Metaverse. My avatar looks forward to meeting your avatar there. <laughs> and now, we move into the panel discussion segment of this webinar. Let me quickly introduce our panelists again. SUTD President, Professor Chong Tao Chong, Founder and CEO of Rainforest Connection, Mr. Topher White, Principal at Zah Adit Architects, Mr. Patrick Schumacher. And finally, may I introduce Professor Tai Li Xiang, who will moderate the panel session. Professor Tai is the Center Director for Design Z, Head of Pillar for Architecture and Sustainable Design Degree, as well as Program Director for Design and AI Degree Program. They will be discussing the questions that you have sent in during registration. Gentlemen, please. A well, very good afternoon to each one of you. And uh, Patrick and Topher, I was totally awestruck by your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I know that I've sent you some questions, but sorry that I'm going to deviate from that. <laughs> Okay. As a warm up, right? Because it's so exciting, I'm going to actually do this. Something which I normally don't do is to invite a very quick uh, response or reaction to the presentations. Uh, what struck you most uh, after hearing two exciting, in fact, three exciting presentations? Um, maybe Tao Chong, just quickly, uh, what, what struck you most when you hear from Topher and Patrick? And I'm going to ask the same with uh, okay, yeah. Topher and Patrick. Yeah. I thought uh, both presentations were very uh, exciting and interesting. Uh, I, it's the first time I, I heard about uh, Topher in putting the, the system recording the sound. And I think that's quite innovative because normally we monitor things by vision and so on. This is by sound. And from the sound, you can derive the activities happening in the, inside the forest. And I think that definitely is very useful for the purpose that I think he set up for. Yeah. And something I think we can learn a lot as well, Absolutely. using sound. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe in future, we can listen to the sound of the building, <laughs> not just the forest, to tell what is going on inside the, the yes. building. Yes, sound of the city, yeah. Yes, sound of life, actually. Yeah. Correct, yeah. And of course, Metaverse was, was fascinating. And I think this is the first time I heard about you know, how you interface with architecture infrastructures. And I, I thought that was also something that uh, resonated with what we are going to have in SUTD, that we are going to make our campus a cyber physical one. And I think that really we can uh, look at Metaverse also not for entertainment, but for educational purposes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, Patrick, we look forward to seeing your avatar in Mesu TV. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Topher, over to you. What's your first uh, reaction after hearing the exciting presentation? Oh, so uh, I was so excited to hear Patrick's talk. I, I love the way you ended it too, um, because that is that's such a vision, right? To to to, to be able to experience nature, um, whether you're there or not. Nature, uh, almost in a curated fashion through the metaverse. I cannot wait to talk and work with you on that because that is, that is, um, that is the future. Also, really, really beautiful imagery throughout that. Um, makes me feel more optimistic about, about living in the cities that we do, um, whether it's virtual or not. Yeah, Patrick? <clears throat> yeah, I was fascinated. I mean, I'm already stimulated. So the auditory track, in a way, and the, and the acoustic design and designing and making vivid the, the, the space in the metaverse with, with sound is actually incredibly important. It's really like when you move from a silent movie to proper <clears throat> sound uh, films, it's, it's a massive uh, shift. So it's, it's so important also for spatial orientation. So I definitely uh, 
you know, I had this on my mind, but it, it's foregrounded again. This is very important. We're going to work on this. And we have now tools also to simulate uh, what uh, various <clears throat> environmental sounds, how they would be echoed, what's the reverberation time, how, how you can sense a space through the acoustic uh, qualities. And there are simulation tools like this, like we now can simulate, you know, sh light and shadow and reflection. You can also now, uh, um, in a way, uh, uh, simulate acoustic reflections, and that gives a character profile. And we are multisensory, and I think uh, it's much easier to integrate this than touch, which which is going to be much harder. So that's the next thing that we're going to work on. And I'm also stimulated by, you know, how he, this fantastic entrepreneurial uh, uh, innovation is is uh, you know inspired by metaphor and analogy, and that's also what drives the metaverse. And yeah. I love that idea of you know, the smartphone in trees. And I mean, there's been quite a few um, a strong meta for the internet of wild things, um, the nervous system of the, of, of the natural world. I mean, these are powerful ways, and I think that's, that's also inspiring, that to, to look for these and, and, and work with these analogies and metaphors is very, very potent, so, so yeah. it's super inspiring. Yeah, isn't this exciting? Uh, I bet you never imagine uh, hearing uh, such diversity on forum like this. And normally, uh, I mean, I'm an architect, I speak in forum as well, like you, Patrick, and we hear from fellow professionals, but this time we're hearing from two extremely different worlds, uh, one in the forest and one in the virtual world. All right, so I'm going to move on next to some questions on the topic of uh, AI. And of course, uh, Tao Chong, you have already introduced the idea of designing an AI degree. Now, I'm going to basically go back to ask you, uh, because you mentioned in 2019 when SUTD started the DAI degree, you said this degree will be the first of its kind in Singapore. For this digital era, data is going to be the currency. AI and machine learning will be the necessary tools to capitalize on. There will be a new generation of designers that will utilize AI in many ways, such as increasing efficiency. Now that you heard Tofa and you have heard Patrick, uh, what do you think this new generation of designers are uh, going to be like? And uh, do you think the industry will quickly embrace them? And what will they achieve in, say, 10 to 20 years from now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think when we first Talk about the the design and AI uh, degree program. Uh, we are looking at you know the the, the challenges the world today uh, uh, is facing. Uh, I know that these are very large scale, uh, complex issues. Uh, I think we talk about the climate change, and sustainability. We talk about uh, rapid urbanization. Uh, aging population, societal issue, and of course all the digital disruption. And, and therefore, I, at that time I mentioned that uh, now we are in the digital era, uh, the currency is just the data, and the tools are actually the, all the machine learning tools, uh, AI tools, and so on. And of course today we just heard about this, now the metaverse, right? more so I think, and also I think we talk about AI, using AI to analyze the sound and so on. So clearly, I think moving forward, uh, data-driven design uh, it can be, I would say, very important. But I'm not saying that uh, AI will take over the human intelligence. Mm -hmm. I think it's about core creation with human intelligence. And I think that will actually make the, the solutions or, to, or products even more uh, effective more practical and more lasting uh, for what we want to do. Yeah. So I believe that uh, this, this degree program will be able to uh, nurture a new, gen, a new breed of a, a designer that will embrace AI and use AI effect, effectively to even make their design better. Yeah, yeah I remember three years ago uh, yeah. when this whole DAI idea was brought forward. We had uh, quite a massive debate as to whether there will be buy-in. But judging from what we hear from the two speakers today, it yes. seems like 
it's the right decision at that time. Yes. And uh, so I'm going to move over to you, uh, Patrick. Uh, again, uh, I'm going to quote you from your interview with Straits Times. Uh, you said that I believe that AI in various forms will have an important role to play in upgrading architectural design creativity and rationality. The process of integrating AI will upgrade the architectural profession. I'm quite sure all of us as architects will have very happy to hear that. Um, and you also said about uh, a further aspect is that intuitive capacities locked in the experienced architects become unlocked and multiply. Uh, I'm very, very intrigued by your statement about unlocking the capacities, uh, capabilities, and I saw that in your presentation. Now, could you uh, talk a bit about what is Patrick Schumacher's uh, vision about this future world of architecture. I mean, again, I just watched a Le Corbusier exhibition outside here in the lobby that was 1940s or even 20s, where he talked about the city of tomorrow. What is Patrick Schumacher's city of tomorrow? Well, first I want to comment and explain what I was referring to when we talk about unlocking um, and maybe proliferating um, expert knowledge which is implicit rather than explicit and we have a lot of this in the design disciplines it seems to be the inevitable the intuitive capacity to 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 respond to complex briefs and sites with with with, with you know selecting from a rich repertoire and this problem solving process is we don't have explicit uh, solution processes but we have a lot of uh, highly worked examples and also these examples we find in, 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 in the des design world, in particular, even we can unlock um, you know, the rationality of traditional design process because it's akin to evolutionary process. There's a lot of embedded rationality in the artifacts we'll find. We have to have a good database and then we can use it to train AI systems uh, with these new kind of generation of guns. And that's happening. That's starting to happen in architecture, but you know, it, that would kind of accelerate and support uh, best practice and that deeper knowledge. You know, we're trying it at schools where we take where we take several years to bring up a new generation of students just by letting them try and critique them and giving some some clues and hints, some heuristics. But this is kind of training of those neural networks. But we have to redo it every every generation. We have to. It, it takes years, and and we cannot. You know spread it around the world and have everybody get get everybody give the best at their fingertips so and of course this is also then maybe a a a a data set where we can also which i also believe in try to understand um and make explicit the, the underlying criteria and ways of working and uh, and have uh, have an explicit theory about some of those seemingly inevitable capacities so both, I think, is very important, but, and we need the theory uh, uh, condition as well when we want to go beyond reproducing best practice and applying it to similar conditions. We want to break out of those historical data sets and, yeah. and venture new, the new. That's why we, I think we still need theory and, and, and um, not only can be left to the AI, but the AI is going to be major important. And uh, I've just uh, uploaded onto Facebook a, a, a very interesting lecture and discussion um, and of the group, the Digital Futures group and the PhD program there. By the way, Emmanuel Co, who is a protagonist here at the school, is also part of that group. So have a look. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a link to a fantastic presentation of, I think, what is state of the art at the moment with AI and architecture and, and an interesting discussion. Yeah, tell us a, a little bit, maybe name three things. I love your night thesis. Uh, name me top three things uh, that you think uh, should be the way the world is going for architecture and cities of the well, night thesis. Yes, so my formula is of course diversity, density, the intensity of connection, everything communicates with everything else, ideally. So there's this inter-awareness, you have your tentacles out and you don't miss 
things which are going on around you. You need to plug in and you need to also, what you're doing needs to be recalibrate with respect to what many others are doing. So you need to continuously not miss out the new stimulation, the new idea. And that's hard. And that means you need to, we need to, that, need to have that 360 degree interface layered and, the, and also the browsing uh, trajectory. We can't rely on preconceived links. So that's very difficult. You need a lot of friction space. So that is the vision that uh, very dense, porous uh, uh, world which you dive in, where many threats you can pick up. And of course, we need to also learn and our supercomputer up here with its cognitive capacities need to, need to be really trained up to navigate that more complex world. So it's this dynamic, complex, diverse, rich yep. and, uh, world which, which we're trying to build. And we need to try to articulate in such that we maintain legibility and empowerment in the face of complexity and not be kind of thrown into visual chaos which paralyzes us. That, yeah. There's a fine line there. Thank you. Right. Over to you, uh, Tofa. Uh, I was also equally fascinated with your presentation, and I think uh, you're probably the youngest of the four here. <laughs> but you're full of passion and you're armed with technology and AI, but prefer to invest your knowledge in fighting for social and environmental causes. Uh, do you see more people following your footsteps and? Uh, what hope do we have in using AI to defend our planet Earth? Are you optimistic about it? Um, so I think there's there's some room for optimism for sure. I, I of course, I, I wouldn't begin to say that other people are following in, in my footsteps. I, of course, am following in, in, in others uh, and we're in it um, all together. I, I have to be honest, I do think there's a lot of fatigue and, and, um, and worry right now. There's a sense of helplessness that people have that can be remedied in a lot of the ways that, that Patrick was 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 kind of talking about. There's an extent to which uh, people are stuck in in in, in more isolated bubbles of, of messaging, uh, and the extent to which we can allow people to break out of that will, of course, increase our own mental capacity for new ideas and imagination, um, but the, but but also our ability to to, to get things done. So uh, the less echo chambers that we have, uh, whether it be in doom around environmentalism, around around even hope, echo chambers of hope that sometimes aren't even realistic. Um, that, that I think will, will really help us. Um, I'm optimistic about one particular thing, which is that people aren't satisfied with the way in which we've been going. People aren't happy uh, at, the, at the moment with the way we, we sort of built, built our worlds. Uh, and there is a, an interest in changing that. Not everyone in the world needs to be happy for us to, 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 to exist, um, or we don't all need to be happy all the time for us to, to get done what we need to get done. But, um, but I do think that we are at a point of potential change and inflection uh, point. And uh, I, I, I do believe that the more that we are able to live side by side with nature in the way that uh, Patrick described at the end, if people are the problem, environmental issues, they are also the solution. And uh, I do believe that, that, that social and economic uh, empowerment as described or what he just, 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 just put forth um, is probably also an environmental solution overall. I, I just want to ask, sidetrack a, a personal question watching your video, mm -hmm. have you ever felt threatened? Have you ever felt your life threatened uh, in those situations? Um, yeah, I mean, I think when, when you're in the field, these are, these are real conflicts uh, there on the ground. But of course, for me to, to be there, I, I'm not at the front uh, of, these, of these fights. These are local people who are there and they deal with the threats all the time. So um, the moment that you feel threatened, you realize that uh, the people you're with are threatened far more often. So they inspire us and you know, hey, that's true. That's true in general. Uh, if you if you want to you know work on big problems, uh, go help the person who has the most impact to do that. Um, and so, so we live vicariously through, or we we operate vicariously through the work they do. So yes, dangerous areas. Uh, the rainforest itself is is an aggressive place. Um, you know, closest closest to death I've had are from are from the forest itself, less the loggers. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, very brave indeed. Right. Uh, we're going to go into uh, last sec of this uh, question, basically focusing on uh, sustainability and happiness. Uh, as you have heard that SUTD, we have uh, made this a theme, uh, which is uh, to create a more sustainable and a happier world by design. Uh, do you think that it's possible to achieve both sustainability as well as uh, happiness? And if so, uh, do you think we can ever measure happiness uh, in our sustainability approach. 
Uh, maybe I could start with uh, Patrick and then uh, Topher and then uh, we'll end with Tao Chong. Well, yes, so, so I'm a bit of a skeptic when it comes to <laughs> the idea of a stable happiness and sustainability is also smacking too much for finding that final equilibrium, that nirvana. That's totally antithetical to, I think, the, our psychological makeup, our anthropological, deep anthropological uh, uh, constitution. We're always driving forward. We need that dissatisfaction. <laughs> And that's why we've reached where we have reached, and we, we're always pushing beyond, and for me it's also the excitement. I'm having this kind of more accelerationist sensibility uh, to conquering ever different and other ways of life uh, which are more empowering and more uh, thrilling, and we get very, very quickly bored when we've solved problems. So happiness is not for us. You, you can't expect it. We're always driving forward and to the next frontier. Yeah, before we move on to Tofa, again, uh, Patrick, just to tap on your experience uh, since you have done some work in Singapore. Uh, do you think that uh, Singap where does Singapore sit in terms of global push for sustainability? Uh, are we a first mover or can we be a first mover? I mean, Singapore as, a, as an entity, as a creation, is incredibly inspirational for me. And, uh, but at the same time, of course, I'm dissatisfied. And, and the project <laughs> we have here is wonderful and I'm dissatisfied and want more and different. But it, actually, Singapore is one of the inspirations also for Liberland. So I don't know about your sustainability ad, uh, agenda and, and, and credentials, but I think I just love that you know, creation of, of a new society from scratch and the way you've been um, original in some of your policies and, and, and um, had found your own path. I mean, deeply uh, inspired. Thank you. Over to you, Tofa. Uh, sustainability and happiness, uh, can they coexist? Well, I think without, without trying to, to overstep my rails, uh, I, I think it's interesting you brought up uh, Corbusier earlier and the city of tomorrow and its planning, which of course was supposed to be a utop utopian city designed around sustainable, sustainable efficiency and how that would make us happy, which of course it, it, it doesn't. The, you know, there is no extent to which we, uh, we aren't necessarily orderly orderly beings, you know, we're, we're messy in our own particular way, which was described in, in Patrick's network of, of interactions and how that create, creatively allows people to grow. Um, and so uh, I do think that uh, a, planned, a planned happiness is unlikely to, to manifest itself, but for the same reason, for the same way that I think it's necessary to, uh, to design things in the forest that look like the things in the forest, or it's important for us to take advantage of all of the, uh, the fruits of these design trade-offs. Like what are all these things that we feel we feel about the designs of our of our current society that we feel are negatives, and how do we lean into those and and then try and develop them to to pull out elements of it that, that might just be inherently human? Um, you know, there's always going to be power structures that that, that make people, um, you know, less than satisfied some of the time. Uh, we are not machines, and we can't be efficiently, you know, guided towards happiness. We have to achieve it uh, on our own. And a society that uh, that is increasingly connected that allows people to to, to mentally grow. Um, and then develop it on their own and see the fruits of their labor, that I think is, um, is possible. So I don't believe in a, in a, in a centrally, in a centrally uh, pushed design, but I do believe that design is a principle. Uh, art is a principle, creativity is a principle. If that's something that a culture can, can, can really push for, you will find no lack of competition, no lack of struggle, uh, but ultimately far greater contentment and truly amazing outputs in general. Thanks, Tofa. Before I invite Tao Chong to uh, again sum up this part of the discussion, Tofa, just a quick question to you. I'm not sure you have been to sure. Singapore. Have you been to Singapore? Okay. okay. Oh, I, 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 love, I love Singapore. It's, okay. As Patrick pointed out, okay. it's the shining city on the hill. Uh, is there some way that we can use uh, what you have invented in Singapore in a meaningful way? Absolutely. I mean, I think that, I think Patrick mentioned uh, interspecies interactions. Like, I think this is our next big mission on earth, I think, is about interspecies infrastructure. How can humans and animals coexist side by side without just putting a wall on the way? Um, there's some places where that's really necessary where nature actually poses a threat to human life, other places where the animals are there but people don't think about it. There are few places in the world that take that as seriously as, as Singapore. Um, and uh, I say that that is a, that is a breeding ground for, uh, for, um, for new projects. So please, let's, let's work together on this. Cool. I'm happy to, to, to put anything there. That would be so exciting, combined with uh, Patrick's metro metaverse, uh, we can see a very, very different Singapore uh, maybe 10, 20 years from now. 
All right, over to you, uh, Tao Chong. Uh, the most important uh, question uh, really comes from the theme for this uh, forum as well as the theme for, or the uh, tagline for our sustainability plan. And there's a more sustainable and a happier world by design. Your thoughts, please. Okay, yeah. I mean, the fact that we have this tagline, more sustainable and happier world, it means that they can coexist. I think uh, maybe when people talk about sustainability, uh, they talk about they have to sacrifice a lot of things and become, you know, inconvenience, uncomfortable, so become unhappy. I think, think this is what we mean by a sustainable, a better world in our definitions. So, uh, on the other hand, I believe that uh, happiness, you know, had a lot of things to do with uh, sustainability. Uh, for example, uh, when we eat something that we, are, we, are, we love, we like, we feel happy, right? But to me, this is more like momentary type of uh, mo mo uh, the, the happiness. Uh, but what we want is a sustainable happiness, right? Yeah, the only right. thing we can have that sustainable happiness is that we do something that we think is meaningful, and meaningful in the sense that you know it maybe uh, make the environment better, uh, grow the society, and connect with people, and so on. And all these are all about sustainability, right? right? So therefore, if we can contribute to sustainability, I think the, the, we will feel really happy about what we do. So to me, I think that must come together. Right. Yeah, it's just like uh, we talk about uh, just now the garden, right? If we so-called place the, the stone nicely, mm. it's actually make you feel good walking through the garden. It's Absolutely. something like that, yeah. Mm. So I truly believe that, you know, if you are more sustainable, you're actually <laughs> happier, yeah. All right, we have uh, just a few more minutes. Maybe I just uh, invite each of the speakers to give a word of advice for students who may be interested to study architecture, uh, study design, and of course, uh, enroll in SUTD. Uh, maybe Patrick, start with you. Advice for interested students. Well, investing in skills and tech, uh, uh, connecting up with the current discourse, investing in uh, computational skills in particular, and new technology, be, be aware and experiment with that. And I think uh, for me, the important thing is happiness, as I said, is, is, is maybe a temporary condition when you've achieved something, but it's more in the setting a new goal, uh, which animates us to, to push beyond ourselves, productivity. I think when we're really unhappy is when we feel unproductive, when we're not achieving anything, when we don't get anything done. And that's why it's also important for, uh, I'm thinking a lot about uh, work environments, collaborative environments, but, uh, it's because I think productivity and fee being productive and what are the conditions of that is, is that, is that um, um, route to a happiness which can continuously be regenerated by setting ourselves new goals. And I think that's, it, it, of course, in the university life, student life is, is one of our, the most thrilling in this respect. You're discovering the world, you're finding new paths, you have an enormous amount of energies and you and, and you, you can work and explore and push yourself, uh, uh, which you would you know, wish when you were a little bit older that you can find that back. So, so you make the most of that period um, and, and explore, invest, and be ambitious. Thank you, Patrick. Topher, any advice for our students uh, interested in design? Yeah. I. If, like, I would say that I think that people should pursue their ideas. You're often helped by the things that you don't know about, about the world uh, and your interest in pursuing those with some confidence. Uh, make sure you get started. The more you talk about an idea, the less likely you are to, to, to build it. But even more than that, I think there's like a certain appreciating what's in, what's in front of us, what we have today without, without uh, measuring progress by change. Progress isn't always about, about change. Sometimes it's about uh, building up things that are there. There's like a real, there's a certain kind of genius in the way things already are in society uh, and the things that we built over countless generations 
um, that have gotten us to now. There's a, there's a lot of genius in the way that nature is constructed over hundreds of millions of years um, to, uh, to, to bring us designs that we can't even appreciate until we look at it. So the more we observe and appreciate the genius, uh, almost not even necessarily planned genius, but inherent genius uh, that's out there, um, which, includes your own, which includes your students and, and everyone that's there, um, I think we'll, 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 we'll feel like we're creating something new, but we'll be building more upon what we already have. Thanks, Tilfer. And Tang Zhong, yeah. <laughs> your words of encouragement for students who yes. are interested yeah. in SUTD. Yeah, I think, uh, as I think we, we hear a lot of this uh, discussion today. Uh, the world is facing a lot of challenges, and I think there are a lot of things that we need to uh, have that design thinking. Uh, basically, you know, we need to have that capacity to uh, see this big picture and then challenge some of this uh, what I call conventional wisdom, the status quo, and then make changes and have action to do that. So I think we need such future graduates that can have that kind of ability and perhaps like passion and dreams that they can go out and change the world. I think that is what we need uh, for the future of the planet, also future of mankind. So I hope our students can take on this challenge, you know, and I think uh, the, the most exciting place for them to acquire such skills and, and also experience, I, I, I think is to come to SUTV. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I will bring this uh, discussion to a close and thank you for your attention. And those of you uh, students or potential students who are looking at uh, future education, I hope you learn from Patrick and Topher and follow their examples. And we do believe that uh, this SUTD is a good place to help make leaders of the future in both design and architecture field. So, ladies and gentlemen, would you join me to express our appreciation for our panelists, uh, Patrick, Tao Chong, and Tofa, for this wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. That was fascinating. We have come to the end of the SUTD Innovation Design Forum in partnership with the Straits Times. I'm sure everyone in the audience and those tuning in will enthralled by your insights on harnessing technology and design innovation for a more sustainable and happier world. Most importantly, we hope that you are convinced that a forward-looking and design-centric education is now more vital than ever to address the challenges facing our world. So it has been an immense pleasure and honour to have all of you grace this event. Thank you again to Minister Fu, Professor Chung, Mr. White, Mr. Schumacher, and Professor Tai. So to all of you tuning in, thank you for your time. I'm Corina Chung. Have a great week ahead, and we look forward to welcoming you to SUTDverse. Okay, now <laughs> we will now end the live broadcast. Uh, before we leave this auditorium, may we have a group picture of the panel? Thank you.